doing time onto Genesis causality in the life matter predicament. Archaeologists, like all agents, are constituted by social worlds that are not of their making. Nonetheless, those who embrace phenomenological methods suspend their ontological commitments by realigning their axis of being and cognitively and sensually engaging with worlds that are not of their making. Phenomenologists do this by intentionally, intentionally exposing and sinking their bodies to and with the residues of material interactions that, are, that we are faced with at the trial's edge. By, um, in this paper, I strip back the complex residues of the material realities we are faced with in, at the trial's edge by this simple interaction and use this engagement to dispatch a visual cultural perspective that entangles contemporary archaeological theoretical positions attending to the life matter predicament. This account is offered as a transaction with archaeological new materialisms and in correspondence with agential realism. The new materialism's term destabilizes the distinction between humans and materials, a key aim being to dethrone the human. I'm inclined to push the motive a little further and um, in response to the critiques that new materialists are faced with, particularly with regards to the ethical implications of what could be argued a trivialising and potentially um, reductive approach to human life, to those critiques or critics, I sort of say, as well as sort of theorising things, um, uh, res theorising, as well as taking things seriously, we theorise things responsibly. There are many nuances in new materialism's discourse, particularly in terms of how the relationships between humans and things are conceptualized. In this paper, I focus on the interface, the between humans and materials. Philosopher and physicist Karen Barrod has brought a new understanding of causality and agency to the academic discourse. In her work, she brings together, rather beautifully, quantum physics and social reproduction. And her ontological reconfiguration of the between has brought into focus how things, all things, but as humans as well, interrupt the causal milieu. Her reconfiguration of ontology makes an important impact upon the relationship <coughs> between agency and structure by presenting a new approach to causality. Whilst new materialism's accounts have slowly segued into archaeological discourse, it was Christopher Whitmore in 2014 um, whose particular contribution stake claim to the theoretical underpinnings of the for the archaeological community and outlined what a new materialism's methodology would look like. He, he proposes that we saturate, uh, take many ambient films, photograph take photographs, um, sort of break the lens almost. Despite the blurred and um, permeable boundary between humans and things that new materialists like Bennett offer, I argue Whitman, Whitmore continues um, to adhere to a clear distinction between humans and things. Materialisms for him are the things that archaeologists start with, that is to say, material culture. <coughs> he writes, archaeologists begin with material things and they follow this stuff wherever it may lead. I argue that whilst this account creates a healthy symmetry between bacteria and humans, his contention that archaeologists follow material culture reiterates a universal human body with definite contours. And this is rooted in a dualism that I'm keen to move beyond, and I think many people nowadays are keen to move beyond, particularly in archaeology. The causal link between archaeologists and material that we follow also sustains a different agency model. I follow Barrett and contend that bodies and norms are co-constituted in practice. My concern is that we do not simply follow matter, and that matter is not as clearly removed, separate, or apart from us as Whitmore's interpretation implies. From my perspective, the work of Bennett and Farad challenges the definite nature of the ontological boundary of the body, an area that Malafurus explores via cognitive archaeology. Thus, the importance of doings, playing with Play-Doh, provides the bedrock on which I support Barrett and her case for, the agent, for agency as an enactment. Having indicated that there is a causal issue, the we follow material culture, in Whitmore's account, from a Baradian perspective, I will now attend to the important work of Malafurus, a theorist who challenges the mind-body dualism via material interactions. Malafurus has utilised the relationship between the potter and clay to explore neuroscientific, a neuroscientific approach to tacit knowledge formation. Malafurus focuses on the interaction between the potter and clay at the potter's wheel to address the agency problem. 
He examines um, the in-between rather than the within persons and things and describes this as brain artifact interface. His approach is situated in externalism. And like Barrett, Malafurus outlines an argument for the presentation of agency as a doing and the emergent product of material engagement. The concept of time is vital to his discussion. He proposes the first condition of agency identification should be to define the portion of time which encapsulates the event you want to describe. To enable this end of identification, Malafurus describes the chrono architecture of the act. Drawing some parallels between Malafurus and Ingold, which I, and I think there are many parallels, um, Ingold, particularly in his work, in his book Making, also discusses humans interacting with matter. Ingold explores making as a process of growth, which he argues places the maker as a participant in amongst a world of active materials. During his argument for making, Ingold shares his experience of taking his students to a cold Scottish beach to practice the millennia old craft of, ba of basket making. Ingold writes, each basket was different, uniquely reflecting the mood and temperament, as well as the physical stature of the maker. Thus the shape and size of the basket was influenced by the affective and physical properties of the makers. And these elements were interwoven and emergent during the creative practice. We need only examine the work of Trevor Marchand on mistake making. For example, to appreciate how material interactions are rarely precisely executed. That, that the feel of the material and the mood of the maker are entwined with the environmental conditions of the day. Wood does not always yield. Thus, transcribing an internal abstract conception of a wood carving onto a block of wood requires a series of decisions and compromises and environmental conditions, in addition to the mood of the maker, all impact upon the emergence of the thing. Whilst Malafurus is focused on the hylonoetic, that is to say, thinking through and with matter, that's, he actually uses the term hylonoetic, Ingold examines the engagement as morphogenetic, the emergence of form. Both concepts are offered as alternatives to the hylomorphic model, a model which is often conceived as a process where blueprints of potential objects are formed in the internal mind and then projected <coughs> onto the material. The crux and problem with the idea being that humans impose form on matter. Key issue with this approach includes so the problematic presentation of matter as passive, and externalist approaches to um, mind contend we think through things and not necessarily before making things. Thus, um, Malafuris succinctly refers to this as an issue of transcription. So Malafuris' focus in the hylonoetic field of human becoming examines the relationship between ma um, matter as hu um, mind and matter as humans emerge. Thus mind and matter are in unison rather than in tandem. And this approach addresses the hylomorphic predicament that both Ingold and Malafuris um, uh, identify by adapting the causality of the emergence. For Malafuris, the focus is on the creative idea that an inseparable mind-matter moment which he describes as a dialectical formation in action. Thus, the potter at the wheel, touching clay, is conceived as a hylo-noetic space. If mind and matter, this is my contention essentially, if mind and matter are truly one, as Malafurus explains, why sustain a dialectical relationship? In many ways, this is a reasonable type of analysis, but by proposing tension between two interacting forces creates a kind of linear chronology, something that is collapsed when adopting an agential realism realist approach. So this is essentially my point that I'm going to get to now. A gentle realism offers a framework that attends to the discursive practices and the material conditions that inform the materialization of matter action. That is to say, what Karen Barrett would say would be the, the phenomena, essentially. Barrett displaces the notion of independently existing individuals by providing a new approach to causality. She argues that difference is not intrinsic to things. Drawing, um, and I draw your attention to Marshall and Aberti's 2014 article, which is really good on this, this theme. Drawing from her background in theoretical pe uh, particle physics, and this is where it gets quite exciting for me, Barrett um, presents the issue of the electron and how contemporary research has revealed 
that the electron can be either a particle or a wave, dependent on the experiment used to measure it. Barrett explains that this goes against classical physics, which states that there are two types of ontologically distinct entities, particles and waves, and these two entities do very different things. Barrett draws attention to the fact that ontology, that the ontology of the entity is dependent on the apparatus used to make the measurement. Thus, if the apparatus is changed, a different entity is produced. Referring to physicist Niels Bohr, she writes that there are no things before the experiment or the measurement, and the very act of the measurement produces a determinate boundary and the determinate boundaries and properties of things. Thus, agential realism addresses the life matter predicament by presenting entities as in phenomena. They emerge from interactions of humans and materials. Barrett places the analyst via the apparatus in relation to the emergence of the phenomena, that being an enactment where agency is produced relationally. Thus, the nuances between these two distinct um, positions, between Malthus and Barrett, um, these positions can help us locate the type of analytical method we wish to employ in our analysis of material events. If we apply the Baradian ontological stance to Malaferis's hyaluronitic space, we can move beyond the dialectical relationship between mind and matter and towards an understanding of process that accounts for a situated relationship between mind and matter. One that locates a crucial facet of the emergence that is often ignored in the study of creativity, the impact of the discourse on the phenomena. Thus, the socio-economic and cultural pressures that influence the culturally contingent making methodologies and more broadly ways of doing could be described as the character of the creative practice. And these pressures and dynamics, these ways of seeing, for example, influence, shape and adapt the senses we use when collaborating with materials. Equally, causality is not simply adapted but collapsed in Barrett's outline. Thus, if quantum physics tells us that an electron can be either a particle or a wave, that ontology is not predetermined but shapeshifts depending on the apparatus used to make the call, then the ontological gap, that causal flow, is collapsed and everything is in the making. Ontogenesis, the work that brings things into being from a Baradian perspective, is the analysis of matter, discourse and action. Thus, the neutrality of cognition that we think we are thinking through or with things is compromised because the tacit knowledge expressed during making directly corresponds to discourse, social mores, and so on. So ontology is important for the discussion and the concept shapes shifts also with the discourse as we can see, see from what I'm talking about today in relation to Barrett. Um, Ollie Harris talks about multimodal ontologies that are heterarchically related. Ontology is no longer a fixed unilateral mode of being applied to all cultures, for lest we forget that in the late 1960s in the anthropological discourse, there was a keen move away from ontology to epistemology. The concept at the time stood for a single mode of being. And this I'm looking at Carothers' 2010. And this, this movement at the time was rooted in the de desire to move from worldview to worldviews. So ontology today is used in the anthropological discourse to mean many worlds. And this is related to a very genuine anthropological position that concedes that there are a multiplicity of worlds. Thus, this novel artwork as a vignette of human material co-production provides insight into the dynamics, forces and tensions that emerge during human material interactions. The artwork also offers conceptual space not only to explore the onto foundations of the life matter binary, but also to examine the terminology used to discuss these transformations. By framing the interaction with matter as phenomena, the focus on the event um, shifts from description to transformation, and by doing so reveals an alternative route for the analysis of emergent materials that avoids the reproduction of binaries, human exceptionalism, and even the unnecessary contortion of, <coughs> things, of things into cosmic bricolage to quote Ingold, and I've just got a little bit, just finishing up now. Whilst, but, um, whilst making, the body moves and makes shapes and forms that correspond to the substance in phenomena. The material's properties and capacities also inform the making event and the agency that emerges from the enactment. When people make, materials and forces enter into correspondence and these expressive gestures can transmit knowledge. 
Therefore, there is a dynamic between matter, the materials, properties and capacities, discourse, the cultural specific movements of the creative practice, and action, the cultural knowledge transmitted during the correspondence between maker and material. In this paper, I've attempted to outline the idiosyncrasies between hylomoetic, hylomorphic, and <coughs> morphogenetic, and propose that the Baradian approach offers something that these models do not. One, model, um, one might think of this model as the hylologos uh, kinesis, that is to say, matter, discourse, action, and movement. To conclude, by applying Barrett's uh, approach to the archaeological, re archaeological record, as I do elsewhere, I acknowledge that I take slight liberties with her epistemological ethical framework. But by arguing material interactions can be seen in the archaeological record, I do not simply assume that people are the analogues of atoms. Nonetheless, when you think about the character and shape of the air between us and the lives that archaeological practice reveal from the ground, how we do time could be the making of us. Thank you.